Hawa Shalawam. So we continue the journey. All right, this is part three of the corn video series, and we're about to get into the part or, or the point of this uh, corn video lessons, which is corn in the Bible. Is corn really what they're talking about in the Bible? All right, we're about to get to that. That's that's what I'm really getting to. That of course before that I had to show you that corn was in the old world, undeniably. All right, undeniably. We're going to show you more references of that on this video, and we're going to go even more further. We're going to go to ancient Egypt, uh, Babylon, Syria, the Greeks, all this stuff. You know, we're going to go to ancient times, right? Prehistory, and we're going to see how scientists determined, right? Historians that what really determines the beginning of a civilization is actually agriculture. When they settle down after being hunters and gatherers and, and, and started at, you know growing their own food right and I'm gonna show you there was people uh, growing corn or agriculture right and had civilizations here in America 5,000 7,000 up to 9,000 years ago right and we're talking about cradle civilization they they tell us it's over there in Mesopotamia and I'm gonna show you there was already whole pyramid city complexes here before Mesopotamia right and they started out with corn there's fossilized corn there that they found and this carbon dating their own carbon dating which is you know their bullshit way of telling us history even their own carbon dating proves it all right so let's get into the video glad you're here let's go so what I want to show you first is basically the origins of corn you know where it comes from and you know the mystery surrounding corn and, and, and these type of plants that ha appear to have been genetically uh, altered at some point all right so we're gonna get into this documentary hosted by ESUS Jesus himself <laughs> no so I'm just playing this he's a bo uh, biologist I believe he'll let you know who he is three dollars for six okay all right thank you great thank you so much have a great day this is an everyday scene, but it's actually pretty amazing. We've taken dozens of wild plants and transformed them into useful crops through the process of domestication. Humans have carefully bred these plants for generations to make them bigger, sweeter, more colorful, and it's hard to find a plant that we've transformed more completely than this one, maize. Here in the US, most of us call it corn, and we eat a lot of it. There's corn bread, corn chips, corn cereal. If you look a little deeper, you'll find corn starch and corn syrup in hundreds of products. And a lot of the meat we eat comes from animals fed a corn-based diet. So maize is all around us, but for a long time, the origin of maize was a mystery. The ancestors of wheat pretty much look like wheat. The precursors of apples basically look like apples, but there's nothing in nature today that looks like this. This is the story of an unexpected collaboration, the story of geneticists and archaeologists working together to discover where maize really came from. Christopher Columbus's crew were the first Europeans to see maize. But by the time Columbus arrived, people all over the Americas had been growing maize for thousands of years. Archaeological evidence from around the world reveals that starting around 10,000 years ago, humans were beginning to live in larger settlements and manipulate wild plant and animal species to better suit their needs. In the case of plants, this process of domestication led to plants that we call crops, like wheat, apples and potatoes. And in most cases, the wild relatives of these crops can still be found in nature. But you can't find anything that looks like maize growing in the wild today. And even the earliest fossil ears of maize, which are more than 6,000 years old, already look essentially like today's crop. So where did maize come from? Many scientists thought that the ancestor of maize must be extinct. 
but a brilliant young geneticist discovered something that made him think that the ancestor of maize was right in front of us. His name was George Beetle. Beetle was studying a grass from Central America called teosinte. He found that teosinte's chromosomes looked nearly identical to those of maize. He also showed that teosinte and maize could produce fertile hybrid offspring, meaning that they must be closely related. Beetle concluded that teosinte was likely the ancestor of maize. But many botanists doubted the young scientist's claims. Maize expert Dr. John Dobley at the University of Wisconsin told me why. So, Neil, the reason I wanted to bring you out here is to show you just how different corn and teosinte are. Yeah. This is a teosinte plant, <laughs> and it doesn't look anything like a typical corn plant. No. And you can start by just looking down at the base. It just branches a lot, so it is a very bushy creature and quite different from a corn plant, such as you see here, yeah. where there's just single main stalk, no branches, and just except for these two short branches, each of which has uh, an ear on it. The dramatic difference in branching between teosinte and maize is just the beginning. When you look at an ear of corn, you can see hundreds of kernels exposed on the cob. But teosinte is different. Each ear only has a handful of kernels, each enclosed in a fruit case that's so hard you might crack a tooth if you tried to eat it. It was no wonder that botanists doubted that teosinte could be the ancestor of maize. Beetle moved on to other questions in genetics, which ultimately earned him the Nobel Prize. But the origin of maize continued to intrigue him. And after his retirement, he returned to that question. To silence the skeptics, Beetle had to show how humans could have transformed this into this. So after his retirement, he launched one of the biggest breeding experiments in history to settle that question once and for all. For Beetle, the key question was how many genes control the differences between maize and teosinte. If that number were small, then it wouldn't have been too hard for early humans to transform teosinte into maize. He began by crossbreeding maize with teosinte. In most plants and animals, individuals inherit two copies of each gene one from each parent. So the offspring from this first generation cross between teosinte and maize, the F1 generation, would have one copy of each gene from teosinte and one from maize. These F1 plants would then be crossed with one another to produce the F2 generation. This is where things get interesting. If only one gene differs between teosinte and maize, then one in four of the F2 plants should look just like maize. And one in four ought to look like teosinte. If two genes are at work, this number drops to one in 16. For three genes, it's one in 64, and so on. If more than three genes were involved, Beetle was gonna need a lot of plants. He decided to grow 50,000 F2 plants for his experiment. And what did he find? About one in 500 plants looked identical to teosinte, and a similar number looked just like maize. That number suggested that changes in just four or five genes were responsible for all the major differences between the two plants. So George Beetle was right. The real ancestor of maize was teosinte, and it was right in front of us all along. Many varieties of teosinte grow throughout Mexico and Central America, and humans have lived there for thousands of years. So where and when did they first transform teosinte into maize? Dobley's team set out to find the answer. They collected DNA samples from different teosinte varieties throughout Mexico to compare their DNA sequences to those of modern maize. The more closely related two groups of organisms are, the more similar their DNA sequences will be. Dobley's team looks for the teosinte variety with DNA sequences most similar to maize. We've actually figured out that 
All of modern corn traces back to one type of teosinte in the southwestern part of Mexico, near a river called the Balsas River. The relatively small number of DNA sequence differences between maize and the Balsas River teosinte yielded another critical piece of information. We can take teosinte and corn and ask how many mutations do they differ by, and then knowing the rate at which mutations occur, make a prediction about how long ago their paths separated. The more differences in the DNA of two groups of organisms, the longer it's been since their ancestors were all one species. Our estimate is that the original domestication of corn would have taken place sometime around 9,000 years ago. Based on genetics, Dobley's team had come up with a hypothesis about where and when maize was domesticated. But the ultimate test would require independent evidence from outside the field of genetics. I visited Dr. Dolores Paperno at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute in Panama to see that evidence. So you're an archaeologist. What did you think when this geneticist from Wisconsin analyzing DNA said, here's where we need to look for the earliest evidence of maize domestication? Teosinte is distributed all over Mexico, highlands, lowlands, it gets down into Nicaragua. So the question for archaeologists was, where do we go? And Dr. Dobley's work told us exactly where to go. 9,000 years ago, people living in this area were taking shelter and preparing food in caves and rock shelters. When we went to the Central Balsas Valley, one of the things we did is to ask local people, do you know of any caves or rock shelters? And that's how we found the Shiwatoshta shelter. So people took shelter there, they slept there, they, they probably ate there. They ate there, they cooked their food there. But finding evidence of ancient maize wouldn't be easy. In the tropical environment of ancient Mexico, the cobs and kernels would typically be scavenged or decomposed. But Dr. Paperno wasn't looking for such obvious evidence. These were the earliest plant processing tools. We call them plant grinding stones, so that's what they were used for, and these are no more than river cobbles. Dr. Paperno showed me how ancient people used these stone tools to grind up maize and other crops. In the process, tiny plant pieces might be deposited on the tool's surface, leaving behind microfossils. So we found hundreds of these microfossils right on the grind surface of the stone. And like the seeds, they're very highly diagnostic. So even with these microscopic traces, you can tell the difference between corn and teosinti. Yes, we can tell the difference. Finding maize microfossils on the grinding tools meant that the humans living in the Shiwitoxla shelter were processing maize for food. But how long ago? Archaeologists can calculate the age of ancient remains using radiocarbon dating. But microfossils are too small to date using this method. So Dr. Paperno used charcoal found in the same sediment layer as the grinding stones to determine the age of the microfossils. And so what was the oldest date of these maize remains? The, it's, it's very interesting how well the genetic and archaeological data fit together. The oldest charcoal date we received back was about 8,700 years ago. between teosinte and maize is that the teosinte seeds are encased in this, this really hard fruit case that makes it really difficult to eat. So clearly, that's something that had to change. That's right. And the remarkable thing is that 
having a fruit case versus not having a fruit case is basically controlled by a single gene. A single gene? A single gene. To test this gene's function, Dr. Dobley's team did a clever experiment. They carefully crossbred maize and teosinte to introduce the maize version of the fruitcase gene into teosinte plants. When they did that, the teosinte kernels, which are normally enclosed in a hard fruitcase, became partially exposed, almost like little corn kernels. When they did the opposite, putting the teosinte fruitcase gene into maize plants, the fruitcase became larger and started to cover up the maize kernels, similar to teosinte. One gene makes a pretty dramatic change. So another really obvious difference between teosinte and corn is that teosinte produces dozens of these little tiny ears on a plant that branches a lot. Uh, and corn just produces a couple of ears on a plant that hardly branches at all. So what's going on there? There is one gene that we've identified that plays a central role in that process, and you call it the branching gene. Dr. Dobley explained how putting the teosinte version of the branching gene into maize made the maize plants more branched, like teosinte. And putting the maize version of the gene into teosinte made the teosinte plants less branched. Dr. Dobley has shown that the fruitcase gene, the branching gene, and just a few others, a small number of genes, just as George Beetle predicted, were responsible for setting in motion all the major differences between maize and teosinte. But how could so few genes cause such huge changes? Why were these genes so powerful? They both belong to a, a special class of genes called regulatory genes. And these are genes that directly regulate the activities of other genes. And so when we move the teosinte version of one of these genes into a corn plant or vice versa, we're actually changing more than just that one gene. That's right, they can turn other genes on and off. You could think of these genes as something like uh, the conductor of an orchestra. And if you would take the conductor from one orchestra and give that orchestra, say, a, a new conductor. Just like we did moving some genes from teosinte to right. maize or vice versa. Right. And you could get a very different quality of music, even though all of the musicians and all the instruments remain the same. These regulatory genes probably influence the activity of hundreds of other genes, which explains how mutations in just a few regulatory genes could dramatically transform teosinte. But there was still one thing I couldn't figure out. So I understand now how teosinte was transformed into maize, but the thing that's still bothering me is that teosinte really doesn't seem like a very good crop. So why would anybody have started growing it in the first place? Well, George Beetle actually had an idea about that question. Okay. And his idea was that they might have used it like popcorn. Huh. And Beetle did an experiment to test his hypothesis that they used it like popcorn. And we can do that same experiment here today. All right, let's do it. Remember, the nutritious kernels of teosinte are trapped inside hard fruit cases. But if they popped, like maize kernels, that could be one way the earliest farmers could have eaten teosinte. In Dr. Dobley's lab, we were about to find out whether the ancestor of maize could pop. Okay, so we actually, we've got some pop teosinte here. And uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna actually give this a try. That looks good to me. And that's basically just like popcorn. That tastes cool. like popcorn. Tastes like popcorn, there you go. So you see how the scientists have been able to track uh, the uh, origin of corn uh, to the Americas and how and found the, its ancestor and they determined that it was uh, somehow uh, genetically modified to get uh, to the corn that we see today. So at some point some great science, you know, some ancient knowledge, you know, the creator, you know, some divine knowledge and science allowed us to have the fruits and vegetables we have today.
And even though they know uh, that this was genetically altered, they still don't know how or who. But, you know, all the ancient stories we're going to start seeing, you know, they give credit to the gods. And we read that earlier as well. If you guys remember in, Te in, in Tibet, it's the first agricultural plant that was given to uh, the people by the gods, right? So we're going to start seeing this. And again, to today and day, scientists still don't know how it was altered, this, this uh, plant. You know, there's a lot of articles you can read online about this. Uh, this one right here says, Mais, or corn, as it is called in the United States. It is one of the three cereal grains upon which world civilizations were founded. It has been described as having a passport without a birth certificate. Wilkes and Goodman, 1996. Because although it is one of the most widely grown food crops around the globe today, its precise parentage has been controversial. All right, so they don't know how it was made. Great civilizations need a great asset. Ancient Egypt had the Nile, uh, right? Uh, we're starting to connect that with the uh, Mississippi River, you know? So, you know, do the research. The Mayans had maize, or corn as others call it. So maize is accepted as man's first and perhaps his greatest feat of genetic engineering. Okay, what well, we just talked about, what we saw in the video, how it was altered, right? Continuing. It nevertheless remains a largely enigmatic crop. Despite decades of research, there is no known wild ancestor. There is no known way to, to evolve a non-shattering uh, variant. So, you know, they're saying they, they don't know how it, they can... It is known that maize does not have a method to propagate itself and thus relies on humans to survive as a species. All right, so these things don't, the corn doesn't grow in the wild. It needs human help to, to harvest, to, you know, to especially to genetically alter it for it to become like the corn we see today, like especially that big sweet corn, you know. Indeed, the human race, and definitely in the pre-Columbian New World, has entered into a powerful symbiosis with this cereal that has fed and continues to feed us all right so corn is very important to humans not only you know ancient world or certain countries it's important to most all uh, civilizations all humans at dna level it, all major cereals rice wheat barley and maize are very much alike but maize is and acts differently from the rest left unattended the other cereals will propagate themselves Maize will not. The reason for this is that maize kernels are lo located inside a tough husk and hence it requires humans to sow maize. It cannot reproduce on its own. This is of course a major evolutionary disadvantage. But as maize has been created by mankind, we have always guaranteed that the species does not die out. Far from it. Do you see? If we stopped growing it, it would go and st extinct. That's what they're saying because it doesn't grow in the wild. Uh, so you guys can understand. I mean, it only grows because we plant it. It's so linked to us harvest harvesting it, taking care of it. You know that's how it's evolved. <laughs> no wild ancestor of maize has ever been found, despite decades of research. Maize's closest relative is a mountain grass called teosinte, which we saw in the video which looks nothing like maize. It is neither a practical food source. Most grasses develop grain near the top of the stem, which when mature will let the seed shatter and the grains will fall to the ground from which new grasses will grow. It guarantees the survival of the species, but it, but it is ill-suited for human agriculture. In wild wheat and barley, a single gene mutation has blocked such shattering which meant that these cereals became more easily harvestable for humans. Teosinte shatters too, and there is no known non-shattering variant. Furthermore, at least 16 genes control teosinte and maize shattering, resulting in a complex problem for those trying to figure out how a non-shattering variation of maize might have occurred naturally by accident, or how our distant ancestors figured out how to create such a feat 
scientists continue to have no idea and this is you know I mean just think about it so I mean we have all these uh, depictions of the gods and stories of gods giving the plan to um, humans right and, and just look at the research that science tells us it tells us that somebody did alter and genetically created uh, uh, the maize we have today the corn we have today uh, because it doesn't grow in the wild you know and they don't know how or they probably do and they don't want to tell us but since we are always been in this journey relating everything to you know our true past you know the Old Testament the Bible you know how far-fetched is that you know our Creator would give us the science right we know Enoch had the science right what it was before it was hijacked right that science to create uh, maize or, or corn just like this all right so it's not that far-fetched we see that some we it, even scientists don't know so if they can't tell you <laughs> where it comes from how can they tell you where it doesn't come from you know what I mean <laughs> so you know that's us for us you know to use our intuition and our, our senses our knowledge our research to put all this together how we're doing right now so so let's continue because we're about to get into America and all these ancient uh, prehistory uh, civilizations and they all had corn so again just before we go into America again you gotta remember that in Europe they already had their version of corn that they said they were getting from Asia right or Turkey mainly they were calling it Turkish corn right so Let's continue now, remembering that. So it says, It was also apparent here that maize was a traditional crop of the New World civilizations. They're talking about America. And thus, two centers of domestication were indicated. So they're saying two centers of domestication were indicated. This, this person saying that at, there was a point where they had established that there was a corn from the New World and then there was a corn from... Uh, Europe that was coming from Asia that was around before Columbus All right accordingly in 1588 Tabema Montanus identified two kinds of corn Turkish corn and Indian corn his Indian corn was a new variety brought back from the New World which was sometimes referred to as India Occidentalis or India Novo which means New India right and we learned already about the India. What are they trying to say, right? The three Indias, the new India, right? Or it's really the old India, the original India, right? This new variety had what we called prop roots and larger ears. Thus, it was distinguishable from old world varieties. The belief that the grain was known in both the old and new worlds is reflected in the scientific name that Linaus gave the plant in 1753. He called it Se. Ma mugs combining a Greek word for grain ze along with native Arawak maiz so you see how they get today's scientific name for for corn which is ze maiz right because it ex existed in both hemispheres but originally it had come from we just we just learned from America so it's been going around the world and everything was always relating back to the third India or the uh, east, the far east India, right? Which was America the whole time. Continuing, uh, over time, there emerged two di diametrically opposed factions. Those who believed that maize was independently domesticated in both hemispheres and others who insisted that maize was a new world uh, domesticated totally unknown in the old world until after Columbus. Supporters of the dual centers of domestication paradigm, paradigm included such famed botanists as Bach, Ru Ruelis, Fuchs, Sismondi, Mikaud, Gregory, Loniser, Amorux, Regnier, Viterbo, Donizer, Tragus, Ta Tabernamontanus, <laughs> Bonafus, St. John, De Touré, Daru, De Herberlot, and Clippart. Alright, those names were hard for me. <laughs> but you see all these famous botanists, right? 
who thought they were from the both from that mice was from both sides and because they knew a species that they grew up with before Columbus and then they saw the new one that Columbus brought that's why it's not because they're just making up something right here right so it says they were close enough in time to accept the Turkish names for mice and traditions of Turkish imports as evidence that the grain originated in the Middle East the botanist Tragus compared Turkish corn to plants described by Pliny and Theophratus in the first century so we read that earlier in that book from 1640 about Pliny right so you see here corroborating they had it in Roman times all right and we're gonna get into this ancient civilizations I told you so we already know it's recorded that Pliny and Theophratus had corn at least the Turkish corn variety that they knew the Greek god of the underworld was Hades he is seen here on an image that was taken from a Greek vase the symbol was a huge cow horn that was filled with grains and fruits. It was called a cornucopia, or horn of plenty. The name for a horn, cornu, was probably the source for the word we use to represent maize. That is, cornu was changed to simply corn. The corn cob was called corn or cornu because it had the shape of a cow's horn. Here is a Minoan merchant and an ocean-going ship circa 1500 BC. This map shows the principal routes that Bronze Age traders used to transport native copper from out of the Great Lakes region. They also brought corn from the same area. Copper traders brought ingots across the North Atlantic to the British Isles, Spain, the Mediterranean, and on to the Middle East. These are a pair of Cretan corn cob rings that were cast from gold in about 2000 BC. They are evidence of the great wealth that was obtained from the corn trade. Corn was the principal food of the lower classes, the merchants, travelers, laborers, slaves, and soldiers. These were the very people upon whose bare backs civilization arose from the earth. And as you uh, just heard there, you know, there's, there's numerous evidence that there was a lot of people coming over to the Americas, uh, trading, getting minerals, uh, bronze, all that stuff, uh, way before Columbus, you know. Um, as it says here, just, for, uh, just to corroborate, because uh, we're going to get into, the, you know, the, the word masa or ma'is, masa, what masa is. Masa is like the dough of, of corn. Uh, you, how you gotta knead it and trash it and throw some uh, alkaline or lemon to get it uh, uh, to the dough that uh, helps you uh, be able to you know, create all the bread and, and the flours and all that stuff uh, to bake. So it says here, of particular interest is the lack of any native names for corn that would serve to establish a linkage between the mainland of Florida or Mexico with the Caribbean islands. Presumably, the Car Car Caribs, the Arawak, and the Taino Indians obtained their first maize seeds from the mainland, and their own name for the plant should reflect a mainland source. But this is not the case. As an alternative, old world names for maize or flatbread should be considered. We have, for example, the Egyptian Mizur, grain of Egypt, Masa, dough or flat flatbread, Jewish Masa, in Greek masa for flat bread. There is archaeological evidence in Thompson 1994 for seafarers from all of these countries visiting, mapping, and colonizing the Caribbean region prior to Columbus. Okay, Thompson 1994. Jeffrey's 1971, page 381, gives the following names for maize in India Maka, Makai, Mecca, Sholam, Moka, Jonah. Mecca Jola. He assumes that the terms involved in Mecca or Maka are referred to the Arabian city of Mecca, but they could be der derivatives of the ancient Egyptian Masa or Masa. Ashraf includes the following for Hindu maize Maka, Rama, Kundrus, Junhari, and Hanta. We heard those names earlier. Uh, he traces these names back to Hindu medicinals, where the Sanskrit word Jaba Nala means read like barley. Okay, so you see how the uh, Greeks had masa and the Egyptians had miser. Continuing says, Spanish archaeologists uh, they have confirmed that maize was present in the Roman Empire. Again, Miguel Oliva found remains of the grain inside third century silos at Ulastrid, along the Mediterranean coast. Research if you like. Uh, this Indian maize was a marginal crop in Spain and Italy up to the time of Columbus. 
Spaniards called it pancio or panic grass. Again, we heard that earlier, and in Spanish we call like bread pan. So that's where the, you know. So when I guess when we relate it to pan or bread is because we're relating it to the old uh, word for corn. Like, you know, a contemporary of Columbus, the famed historian Peter Martyr, compared panic grass growing around Milan in Granada to the New World plant mahis that Columbus had brought back from Hispaniola in 1493. Martyr noted that the same kind of grain, the size of peas, was found in abundance among the Insubres, people of Milan, Italy, and the people of Granada. Continuing uh, from this book uh, here, it says, Indeed, no doubt can be entertained that maize was cultivated among the Americans. When P. Martyr and Sella, John de Larry, Lyot, Torquemada, and others relate to us that the first Europeans who landed upon the New World saw there, among other marvels, a gigantic weed with a long, smooth blades, elegant stem, and golden ear. And again, he's saying, indeed, no doubt can be entertained that maize was cultivated in America. Remember, they're still debating where it's, it's coming from. But he's saying that definitely they know that the New World or America had its you know, uh, own uh, uh, species that was indigenous there. At this time, they were still trying to debate whether it was original from there because we saw the video and uh, the science behind how they uh, found where it originated. This was later on in, in time, in history. So these people are still debating in, in, when this book was written. So let's continue. It says, This marvelous wheat was the maize. Several nations celebrated its harvest amid religious ceremonies. At Cusco, the holy city abode of the Incas again if you know from <laughs> one of my videos the city of David Cusco relating that to Jerusalem or, or where the city of David was located right the ancient Jerusalem and look what it says here it says at Cusco the holy city the holy city Columbus came to America he wrote in his book uh, book of prophecies the libro de profecias that he, he was going to go uh, reconquer the Holy Land and Mount Zion for the Queen Ferdinand, you know, or the King Ferdinand. And so it, it's corroborating here, saying Cusco, the Holy City, a body of the Incas. All right, so let's continue. The, the virgins of the sun prepared with that precious corn, the bread of sacrifice, tinged with the victim's blood, it says here. Cor you know, we know that these cities were at some point run by Jebusites, and that's why King David had to, you know, and Joshua and everybody had to reconquer. They had to, you know, get rid of all these uh, Canaanites that were there. So, doing their sun worship and uh, sacrifices. Uh, so it says here, in Mexico, they formed with it idols, which the priests broke and distributed the fragments thereof to the multitude. A goddess Ceres, right? Ceres, I don't know if you know, but that's a Greek goddess. So it says here, a goddess Ceres worshipped under the name Sinteut. So this is the origin of Ceres. This is the original name of Ceres, or where they get the energy of Ceres and the whole Ceres, the goddess of corn, because you're going to see that later in Greek. But first, she was called Sinteult, right? Derived from Sentli, or Maize, in Mexican language. Sentleult, derived from Sentli, or Maize, in Mexican language, received as an offering the harvest first fruits every nation in mexico peru brazil orinoco's plains orinoco river plains and tila islands were nourished with that grain maize cultivated over a space 90 degrees south and north of the equator was the wheat of the new hemisphere it was there used as money or standard of exchange and the law among Mexicans condemned to death whoever stole seven years of maize. And I'm, I think when he's referring to Mexicans, he's referring to the ancient the cultures that were there. Uh, the Aztecs, uh, you know, or the Mexicas they were called, and all the other uh, Quiche, Maya nations, Aztec nations that were there. says here, Orthodox historians justify the fame and glory bestowed upon Columbus by reminding us through such grandiose exhibits of the mariner's illustrious achievements 
The only problem is that maize cultivation was already present in Europe, Africa, and Asia many centuries before Columbus was even born. The antiquity of maize in Europe goes back at least to Roman times. During the first century, uh, C.E. Pliny the Elder described several plants that were first domesticated in the New World. These included hen, bane, or tobacco, and maize, which Pliny called India, India millet. As early as the 16th century, Spanish historians Joseph de Acosta realized that maize like plant was known, I'm sorry, that a maize like plant was known to the ancients, the millet that came from the Indies into Italy. Ten years before Pliny wrote about it, hath some resemblance upon maize, maize, for it is a grain, as he says, that grows in reeds and covers itself with the leaf, and hath the top like hairs, being very fertile, all of which things agree not with millet. Markham, 1880, 231. So you see Pliny describing corn. Um, so you see uh, Pliny uh, describing corn, uh, you know, without a doubt. Because it doesn't fit millet, all right, the description. So uh, let's continue. We're seeing already that, you know, ancient times had corn. You know, we're going to start seeing more and more. Uh, it says here from uh, this uh, work or this uh, book here from uh, Joseph Franco of Mico, it says, it says he has written in three uh, volumes of uh, the work entitled History of the Crusades. It's a popular book. Some very interesting information. On page 182 in volume 2, Micard writes about the enrichment of the fields and gardens of France and Italy by the introduction of some plants that were before that time unknown in Europe. What is absolutely amazing about this section of the history of the Crusades is that the exclusive American crop known as maize is mentioned on page 183. See the screenshot to the right. So it says here on the uh, screenshot on the uh, book itself, it says here, uh, and begins, sent into the, his Marquis, uh, Marquisate some seeds of maize, which had never before been cultivated in Italy. A public document which still exists attests the gratitude of the people of Montferrat. The magistrates received the innocent fruits of victory with great solemnity and upon their altars called down a blessing upon a production of Greece that uh, would one day constitute the wealth of the plains of Italy. Right. So it's, uh, I guess they're talking about um, how they were uh, given uh, the plant maize and it helped their economy and agriculture, gave them food and, and you know, it says that one day it helped them constitute the wealth of Italy. So. It's very important. It's recorded that it's been there. This is an American Indian corn they're talking about in this book. And on the right here it says the son of uh, Domenico Casanueva, also known as Christopher Columbus. Cristoforo Colón, Cristoforo Colombo and Cristobal Colón set out on an expedition to a land that had been known historically for thousands of years. So a land that had been known historically for thousands of years, ancient Egypt, Atlantis, the East India or the Far East or the Third India. The writings of the Spanish conquistadors described the mosques that were in Mexico in 1511. Mosques that were in Mexico in 1511. And you can also read about that in other books. I believe American Holocaust, how they, when they got there, how they saw the temples and the buildings and the, you know, and, and the Aztec uh, capital. These Spanish con conquerors described the stunning towers and cities that were more beautiful than the cities of Spain. This goes against what most of us were taught in school. However, I will show you in Corn in the Bible that not only does the, does the mention of corn in the Bible prove the Bible came to life in the Americas, but that there is ancient history of those lands that have been hidden for over 500 years. And this is from the uh, great work of uh, this person right here, Michael Wall and his uh, research into corn in the Bible. This book, as you see here, corn in the Bible, which we're going to get into later, not the book, but the whole the theory, you know, of corn in the Bible, as we've been reading all these verses so far in this video. Let the prophet who has a dream tell the dream, but let the one who has my word speak it faithfully. For what has the husk to do with the corn, declares Hawa. Jeremiah 23:28. They should collect all the food of these good years that are coming 
and store up the corn under the authority of the Pharaoh to be kept in the cities for food. Genesis 41, 35. Several volunteers of the Time Detectives scoured the collections of museums in London, Berlin, Paris, Rome, New York, Chicago, Cairo, and San Francisco. One of the challenges confronting time detectives is that Egyptian artifacts have been sold, stolen, or given away to many private collections and museums. In other words, the clues to the mystery of the Egyptian maze are spread out all over the world. We found lots of evidence of corn cobs and corn plants in the Egyptian tombs and temples. This comes as quite a surprise, considering that all the authorities, all the tenure professors, and all the encyclopedias claim that there is no evidence of Egyptian maize. All right, now, now think about that. So why would tenured professors and encyclopedias say there's no evidence of maize in ancient Egypt? You need to think about that. I mean, is it that they didn't really know? Or that they didn't want us to know? All right, I mean, there isn't obvious as why not, but if it's not obvious to you yet, we're going to get into all the evidence or historical. Uh, and of course, we're going to relate that to the Americans, right? Because we know the ancient Egypt or ancient Egyptians were in America. You know, Atlantis, as the Greeks called it, ancient Egypt was America. All right, so uh, let's just start here because this is going to corroborate uh, this article here from Peru. Uh, regarding the study of maize there uh, and it says over the past several decades anthropologists active in the field of ancient Peruvian civilization have scrutinized the role played in by the grain maize this may seem like rather an, an odd thing to be uh, scrutinizing but how a civilization feeds itself has a remarkable impact on how it develops ancient civilizations that became dependent on farming such as Egypt and China established permanent settlements. So farming was very important in Egypt and China, right? The consequence of this was the development of traits that we attribute to a civilization, such as monumental architecture and organized religion. Recently, a consortium of North and South American higher education institutes including the Field Museum, Chicago, USA, published a paper confirming that the rise of ancient Peruvian civilization was linked to the extensive farming of maize during the late Archaic period, 3000-1800 BC. All right, so it's not just that uh, agriculture, but maize, the main plant, maize, right? Remember that the Tibetans said that the gods provided them uh, their first plan uh, of agriculture was the maize, the corn, right? So you see the years of the Peruvian civilization here. If you can compare that to ancient Egypt, as it says uh, anywhere in Google, if you Google it, how old ancient Egypt is, you're going to see it's almost the same dates. All right. So let's continue. Now, uh, speaking of establishing permanent settlements uh, in ancient Egypt and uh, in these pl places like Peru, um, I, I found this interesting in, in Wikipedia uh, regarding the cradle of civil civilization. I want to read it to you guys. It says, Historic times are marked apart from prehistoric times when records of the past begin to be kept for the benefit of future generations, which may be in written or oral form. Oral, right? Just like the natives. Oral form. If the rise of civilization is taken to coincide with the development of writing out of proto-writing, the Near Eastern uh, Chalcolithic, the transitional period between the Neolithic and the Bronze Age during the 4th millennium BC, and the development of proto-writing in Harappa in the Indus Valley of South Asia around 3300 BC, are the earliest in incidences followed by Chinese proto-writing evolving into the Oracle Bone Script and again by the emergence of Mesoamerican writing systems from about 2000 BC. So they're saying if they go in based on writing, then I guess they give, will give the credit to the, the Harappa and the Indus Valley and then in Asia, right? Um, if they go based on writing, so it, they're not even including Samaria there. You see how they didn't even include Samaria there, right? Or ancient Egypt. All right, so now continuing, it says, in the absence of written documents, most aspects of the rise of early civilizations are contained in archaeological assessments that document the development of formal institutions and the material culture. 
a civilized, in parentheses, way of life is ultimately linked to conditions coming almost exclusively from intensive agriculture. All right, so again, it, it says it is contained in archaeological assessments, right? That a civilized way of life is ultimately linked to conditions coming almost exclusively from intensive agriculture. So in reality, the rise of a civilization is based on their agriculture. And we have a lot of these civilizations saying that corn or showing depicting corn as the gift of the gods or the first grain or first plant they uh, harvested and grew they grew and harvested right and continues as Gordon uh, Childe defined the development of civil a civilization as a result of two successive revolutions the Neolithic Revolution triggering the development of settled communities and the urban revolution which enhanced tendencies toward dense settlements specialized occupational groups social classes exploitation of surpluses, monumental public buildings and writing. Few of those conditions, however, are unchallenged by the records. Dense settlements were not attested in Egypt's Old Kingdom and were absent in Maya area. The Incas lacked writing altogether because they had oral history, right? And often monumental architecture preceded any indication of village settlement. For instance, in present-day Louisiana, Researchers have determined that cultures that were primarily nomadic organized over generations to build earthwork mounds at seasonal settlements as early as 3400 BC. Rather than a succession of events and preconditions, the rise of civilization could equally be hypothesized as an accelerated process that started with incipient agriculture and culminated in Oriental Bronze Age. So what was first agriculture? Agriculture. We're going to read how important this agriculture was for the ancient Egyptians, which were the Native Americans or people that were living in America. You know, all the tribes are different tribes there, right? Not all of them were of Israel, right? So, but... You know, Israel lived among the Canaanites, Moabites, Amorites, and all the rest that are in the Old Testament that Joshua and David had to cleanse from these holy uh, places, right? So, now let's continue knowing this. You know, we know that agriculture is the rise of civilization. And again, we saw the date of the uh, civilization in Peru was 3000 BC. We're seeing that the, it says here that the uh, generations were, were basically building earthwork mounds at seasonal settlements as early as 3400 BC. So there's people in Louisiana, America, in 3400 BC creating monuments, these pyramids, right? 3400 BC, they call them monuments, they're pyramids, right? In 3400 BC, again, look up the date for the rise of the ancient Egypt according to uh, encyclopedias and Wikipedia and all that. You'll see it's basically the same date. I think they say 3500, 3400 BC. So again, in order for people to gather, say, hey, let's get together, let's start building a civilization, <laughs> let's start growing, right? Because that's what it is, right? Let's, let's get together and, and create agriculture, let's start farming, let's settle down, and uh, let's build these huge pyramids, these, these temples, right? That takes a lot of time. So even before 3400 BC, they, they were already getting established even before that. So because there's a process to all this, right? It, you can't just say, oh, let's build a mound. Don't know how to build it, right? You got to learn the science behind it. That takes time. So uh, continuing with the uh, mounds here, it says here, no one could envision how ancient Americans could have built the mounds and earthworks without a reliable food source. Most assumed that this crop system would be based on the same system of food production seen across the Americas, the three sisters of corn, maize, semis, beans, and squash. When Europeans first arrived, the three sisters were prevalent among the northern Iroquois and Algonquins, the southeastern uh, five civilized tribes, the southwestern Puebloans, and throughout Mesoamerica and South America. Yet even by the mid-20th century, there was no concrete evidence supporting this assumption for Ohio Hopewell. Then in the first major excavation at an Ohio Hopewell habitation, a couple of carbonized corn cups were recovered in a sealed 
made in context that seem to solidify the case for Hope Willian maize agriculture. This excavation was conducted in Ross County by Olaf Prufer in 1963 at a site uh, he called the McGraw site. While the legitimacy of the cause ha has been debated, at this time they do seem to represent real examples of Ohio Hopewell corn. However, what has failed to materialize is widespread evidence of an intensive uh, maize agriculture, according to them. So, uh, you see how they were able to find these corn cups in these mounds. Uh, you know, and we saw earlier, 3400 BC, they were already growing and building mounds. They were growing corn and building mounds in 3400 BC. All right, in America, keep that in mind, because we're gonna learn about uh, ancient Egypt, right? We're gonna learn about the Nakata period. This is before the first dynasty, so pre-dynastic uh, times. As as you can see here in the bottom, it says Nakata one, which is around 4,000 to 3,500 BC. Nakata two, about 3,500 uh, to 3,200 BC, and then Nakata three, it says here about 3,200. Uh, BC to 3000 BC. So this is their chronology. Remember that. So, we, you know, dodge the hijack. But still, they're saying uh, these periods are those dates. We just read that, um, you know, they were building uh, mounds and growing corn in 3400 BC in America, Louisiana, right there, where the mounds are. All those areas of Memphis and the Mississippi. Uh, so, as you can see, the days are similar, right? So let's continue. So it says here uh, regarding Nakata uh, period 2, also known as the Jersey and uh, due to finds near the village of that name. Uh, it says phase began around 3500 BC. Okay, so when did we start building mounds and growing corn in uh, Louisiana? 3400 BC. So this is matching up around that time, right? It says this, cu this culture mastered the art of ag agriculture. This culture mastered the art of agriculture and the use of artificial irrigation and no longer needed to hunt for their food the people started live in towns not just villages creating areas of higher population density than ever before the culture continued to develop their artistic tendencies creating new styles of pottery and more intricate carvings all right so we just read right so nakata 2 was the main thing that started in nakata 2 period around 3500 bc it says they mastered the art of agriculture. All right, and we saw before that basically the start of a civilization is determined based on more really than the agriculture than, than language and anything else. That's what their the scientists narrowed it down to. And we saw Louisiana, uh, where the mounds are, they were already uh, growing corn in agriculture around 3400 BC. So that had to take some time to learn right so you study even before that so let's continue with uh, Gunnar Thompson's uh, video he's gonna talk about the Nakata period and what they found uh, in ceramics and the pottery that you we read here you know they also started creating new styles of pottery right so what they were drawing in the pottery he's gonna talk about so let, let's now we know you know let's dodge the hijack so let's you know we're saying ancient Egypt is in America right and we got proof that in the mountains of Louisiana they were already building and civilizing themselves, right? Creating towns, creating villages. I mean, I'm sorry, cities. Settling down agriculture, right? In 3400 BC. So let's go. Here's an example of an artifact that was decorated with corn plants at the Cairo Museum. It is from the, the Nakwada I phase of archaeology. That means that the artifact dates to about 4000 BC. That's from the earliest phase of farming along the Nile River. In other words, the corn was already there when the ancient Egyptians first started farming. Here is a comparison of a Hopi Indian maize decoration with the Egyptian corn plant in the middle. The pattern of drooping leaves terminating with corn tassels at the very top are very similar to the modern corn plant. Here is a schematic drawing of a tomb mural from the Cairo Museum. The mural dates to about 2000 BC. The corn plant is with a food offering display on the right hand side of the mural. Here we see an enlargement of the mural from Amenhemhet's tomb, and the corn plant is identifiable from the yellow corn cob and the green husk leaves. Many of the Old Kingdom murals were not very well uh, carved or painted, and one Egyptian authority, Helen Strudwick, calls this Old Kingdom example lettuce. Another variety of maize is shown in this example from a tomb on the Giza Plateau near Cairo. 
Typically, the maize ears are shown on platters or on food displays, along with breads, jars of beer, and butchered animals. Here's an example of a tombstone with a corn cob. There was an association of maize with the Osiris cult of resurrection. Tens of thousands of these stone monuments were made in Egypt. The British Museum has over a hundred stored away in a warehouse. This is an illustration from a papyrus book called the Book of the Dead. It comes from a scroll in the British Museum dating to about 1200 BC. These examples are from the British Museum. On the left are Sumerian hieroglyphs for corn and a generic glyph for grain that is in the shape of a corn plant or a bush. On the right hand side is a glass jug with a corn plant which served as a decoration. Here is a comparison of a Sumerian glyph for grain and a modern corn plant. The Sumerian grain symbol dates to a period between 4000 and 5000 BC, so it would appear that corn or maize was present in the Middle East right about at the time that huge city-states started forming up along the Tigris and Euphrates rivers. This was very near the dawn of Western civilization. A period called the New Kingdom starts in about 1500 BC in Egypt. It is at the beginning of this period that corn cobs had their greatest level of realism. This example is from the tomb of Nakhet, circa 1424 BC. There is a corn cob with very distinctive kernels. There can be no question that this plant was intended to represent Indian corn. Here's another example of corn cobs from the tomb of Seti I, dated to about 1292 BC. And uh, he mentioned uh, depictions of corn in ancient Samaria. So, I mean, when you start really looking for uh, for it, uh, corn in, in these uh, places, you start really finding it. So you start noticing that it's actually a, a major part of their <laughs> religious symbology. And uh, always, like in other cultures, the gods, of course, has given it to them. Right? In this case, we see here Thoth, <laughs> okay, the eagle, right? Marduk, whatever he's called. Uh, it's giving them the uh, corn uh, from the tree of life, as they call it. Right? And they have a lot of depictions of this tree of life. As you can see, and they try to say it's acorns. Once we start really doing the research and corroborating with other uh, evidence and other uh, historical uh, data, then we know it's corn. So, um, continuing, it says here If we look closely at the hand of the winged figure from the palace of Sargon at a Akkad in Assyria, he appears to be holding something which he has just plucked from a sacred plant or tree and has sometimes been described as fir cone, a sponge, the spathe of a male date palm, Maspero, history of Egypt, Chaldea, or a head of corn or maize, America's ancient civilizations, A. Hyatt, Beryl and Riff, Beryl who, who thought, page 118. It seems probable that maize was carried from America to Asia by the earliest Sumerian voyagers, and we already know that's very probable with all the evidence we've just read. But in its new home, where the people were unfamiliar with its proper cultivation and hybridization, it, it deteriorated and died out, whereas in America, where the Indians were familiar with the proper care of corn, it increased and improved. That should surprise us, because corn or maize was not said to be imported into Europe until after discovery of America by Chris Christopher Columbus in 1492. Alright, so it says that should that should surprise us. It, it definitely do sh should surprise us. That's what I'm trying to point out here. But, you know, he's like, how come people ain't realizing this, right? Same thing. So it says here in 1482, although James Bailey, uh, God's, uh, God Kings and Titans, tells us that maize was introduced into Spain by the Arabs in the 13th century. So more uh, corroboration saying the Arabs, right? And this is most likely uh, appearing to be most likely the Moors, right? That they were going back and forth. So now, again, you know, in history, we're, we're led to believe that uh, civilization and, and the oldest ones started in this area called Mesopotamia, Summer, you know, Samaria, Syria, Babylon, uh, ancient Egypt. And, um, you know, we can see that at the same time, even, even before that, uh, well, almost at the same time as Summer and Mesopotamia, we got... Um, corn cobs, fossilized corn cobs being found in Peru, you know, 5,000 B.C. You know, that's 7,000 years ago. And there's even older ones, 9,000 years ago. 
says here, ancient pop corn discovered in Peru. It says in small letters here first, says, these ancient corn cups date roughly from 6,500, 4,000 years ago. A is a proto-confite Morocco race, or Morocco, right? Depending on how you read it. Uh, B says, confite Chavinense maize race. And C is a proto alasan maize race. People living along the coast of Peru were eating popcorn 2,000 years earlier than previously reported and before ceramic pottery was used there, according to a new paper in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, co-authored by Dolores Piperno, curator of the New World Archaeology at the Smithsonian's National Museum of Natural History and emeritus staff scientist at the Smithsonian Tropical Research Institute. All right, so let's keep going. So it says here, a 5,000-year-old corn cup found at a pyramid at the ancient Peruvian site of Carol Supe, which appeared in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences, Haas' team of researchers examined and evaluated ancient microscopic residues of maize in the form of pollen, starch grains, and uh, feet Tolids, plant silica bodies found in soil on the stone tools and in cro cropo, sorry, copro lights from ancient sites used in 212 instances where carbon 12, 14 dates were obtained. They focused on 13 desert valley sites of Patibilca and Fortaleza, north of Lima, where they found broad botanical evidence that indicated extensive production. Extensive, right? extensive production, processing, and consumption of maize between 3000 and 800 BC. Uh, Coincides with uh, the last Nakata three, right? If we remember the ancient Nakata periods. And after that, the first dynasty of Menes, right? Or Mizraim, which is Ham's son, or Menes, was after that. So during this time, it says extensive production and processing was going on in Peru. Right? It says the two most extensively studied sites were Caballete, about six miles inland from the Pacific Ocean and consisting of six large platform uh, mounds arranged in a U-shape. So again, it's, it says it's consisting of six large platform mounds arranged in a U-shape and the site of Huariganga, about 14 miles inland, featuring one large mound and several smaller mounds. They targeted residences, trash pits, ceremonial rooms, and campsites, but most of the samples were taken from trash pits of residents. Nor is that all. It turns out that sweet potatoes were the second most popular carbohydrate and guava the most popular source of sugar. House reports shows that rather than being a maritime-based society, Chico Norte was an agriculturally-based society. This means that South America falls in line with the rest of civilizations of the world. All right? It falls in line with the rest of civilizations of the world, not of the Americas, of Sumer, of Egypt, of Babylon, of Mesopotamia, of the world. Prior to this latest discovery about corn, it was generally accepted by historians that maize was domesticated in Tehuacan Valley of Mexico. The Olmecs and Mayans cultivated it in numerous varieties throughout Mesoamerica cooked, ground, or processed through nixtamalization, and we're going to learn what that is, that's how you make the masa, right, to make the dough for the breads and all the other uh, things you can do with the dough. Uh, beginning about 2500 BC, the crop spread through much of the Americas, okay, the region developed a trade network based on surplus and varieties of maize crops, however, as can now be seen, Corn was being grown in the coastal region of Chico Norte in South America as early as 5000 BC. So it's uh, actually rewriting history here because they've, they've, there's evidence here showing that it was already being uh, grown extensively in 5000 BC. All right, this is way before the Nakata periods. All right, way before Nakata periods, in line with summer Mesopotamia, even possibly older. And you're telling me. All right. Remember, agriculture starts out. I mean, civilization starts out with agriculture, right? That's that's how they have come down to summarize uh, the start of civilizations. And we can see here that in the Americas, they already had mounds, they had pyramids. I'm going to show you uh, the city, as you can see. And um, 
so for them to get to uh, this point of uh, being civilized like building mounds have the science the knowledge uh, language and agriculture it takes time so even before that they were getting this started so they're even older than that right all right so let's continue now with you know Syria but you know we got to dodge the hijack because we know better now all right so we're gonna hear more about them but we're gonna see why they have so many depictions of corn in their walls we gotta understand why it's so easy for us to see why because it was on this side all right let's go it says here the sacred city of Karal Supe. Believe it or not, the mighty rises and stepped pyramids of the sacred city of Karal Supe were built roughly around the same time that Egypt's old kingdom ruled the sands of North Africa, making this awesome site some 2,600 years old or more, the oldest city in fact in the entire of the Americas, okay, so not the Olmecs, okay, so they always told us that the Olmecs was the oldest civilization. This is 5000 BC as we just showed you, and you can just Google and look it up, research it yourself, you see uh, why they're giving it that date. Uh, so let's continue, it says, visitors to the spot today can just about make out the dusty mounds of the colossal, colossal carol temples that bubble up on the horizon. There's also a curious geoglyph cut into the desert floor, and interestingly, not a single trace of weaponry or fortifications. So yes, yeah, very interesting. No trace of weapons, right? So these people not only lived here a long time ago, but they didn't have to worry about war. You know, would have to know who they were to understand that why. But uh, as you can see, this drawing right here is from uh, the book from this author Charles Weiner, as he um, this uh, drew or what he saw at, um, at Paramonga. It's a ruin in, in Peru in 1880, and um, this is how it looks now as you can see and this is the book uh, in case you guys want to see it it's uh, it's in French but uh, as you can see we have a lot of uh, pyramids over here man and not only pyramids I mean these are like um, castle pyramids these are badass pyramids you see and these is they are old these sites are old right what are the difference between these and the uh, old uh, uh, old kingdom pyramids and, and that's on the other side of the world in Egypt right uh, nothing really all right so, you know, it's perspective, you know, I'm showing, I'm not just telling you uh, ancient Egypt was over here, Atlantis was over here, I'm showing you, all right, use your senses, what is the difference, I mean, this is just, I'm just scratching the surface once again, man, and even all my videos, you know, it's little by little, we're going to start seeing more and more evidence, all right, but you guys got to start using your senses and perspective. All right, so it says here from the Smithsonian.com. It says, for decades, uh, school children have learned that civilization has four ancient origin places, Mesopotamia, Egypt, the Indus Valley, and China's Yellow River. In the past 20 years, researchers have added a fifth member to this select list, the Central Andes, which includes southern e Ecuador, northwestern Bolivia, and most of Peru. All right, you heard that, right? Most of Peru, Peru Salem. Here we know... Now, uh, were pyramids and temples as old or, at or older than those in Egypt. Again, here we go again. It says here, we now know were pyramids and temples as old as or older than those in Egypt. Older than Egypt, people. You're hearing the Smithsonian to come. Older than Egypt. All those hijacks, all those um, people bringing statics, talking about my theories. Smithsonian.com says there's pyramids older than Egypt here in Peru. All right, with vast irrigation networks that rival those in ancient summer and artworks that would endure for centuries, even millennia. Just as in India and China, rulers built walled fortresses, religions flourished, and armies clashed. In this realm, the Inca were Johnny come. Late li lies or late lies, flash flashy. So Johnny come late lies flashy, ruthless newcomers whose empire barely stretched across two centuries. It says here, left unattended, the asphalt paths of the U.S. interstate highway system would disappear in a few decades. But hundreds of miles of the Capac Nan, paved with heavy stones linked by suspension bridges that had not equal in Europe or Asia, engineered with astonishing care 
remain despite centuries of neglect. All right, so they're talking about those Inca roads, right? You can hike along them for days. People who walk through these extraordinary landscapes are more are not merely following in the footsteps of the Inca. The Capac Nan was built atop roadways created by the Inca's many pre predecessors. To journey here is to roam through almost 6,000 years of civilization. 6,000 years of civilization. That they're saying 4,000 BC, right? Uh, to one of the places where human enterprise began. Human enterprise began. All right, one of the places, the places. Uh -huh. This is the old world. It says here, the new world's first monumental civilization from popular archaeology. It says, before the great pyramids arose on the ancient Giza plateau in Egypt, thousands of miles to the west, a thriving ancient civilization began constructing monumental structures not far from the Andes Mountains in what is today Peru. Like the ancient Egyptians, they too were a deeply religious people, creating what they believed would be a lasting legacy to their gods and kings. Unlike the ancient Egyptians on the other side of the world, however, these people would eventually pass into oblivion. There were no ancient records and no pottery, other than buried structures to testify of their existence, it would be left to archaeology to raise them into modern consciousness. In 2008, a team of archaeologists hunched over an excavation in a dry clearing among cultiva cultivated fields of the Cosma Valley near Peru's northern central coast. Here, led by a German archaeologist Peter uh, Fuchs, or Fox, they uncovered a circular sunken plaza built of stones and adobe. Radiocarbon dating of the materials unearthed at the feature revealed that it had been built between 3500 and 3000 BC. Now that relates to Naka, na, the Nakata period too, or as much as 5500 years ago. And it says in the Nakata period too that that's when they started uh, extensively doing agriculture, right? So, I mean, we have to trust carbon dating, which w there's other uh, studies showing that it's not very accurate. But that's what we have to go by, and, and, and even they are dating this really old, right? Uh, making it arguably the oldest monumental structure found in the New World. It was the latest and perhaps most sensational discovery at the Section Bajo Archaeological Complex, a site that teams of archaeologists had been investigating since 1992. It demonstrated that in ancient Peruvian people were building structures typical of ancient urban settlements around the same time as the people of Mesopotamia, Egypt, and India, long considered the earliest architects of urbanized civilization. So, you can see, see people, we need to rewrite history. Alright? This is research that's going on. Alright? This is not no myth. This is not theories I'm making up. Alright? We need to rewrite history. We need to understand that they've lied to us, all right? Because they can't play dumb like they didn't know, right? They just didn't want to tell us, all right? So it says here, whoever built Sechimbajo had a good knowledge of architecture and construction. That takes time to develop, all right? That takes a lot of time to develop that science, that knowledge. Said Fuchs to a Los Angeles reporter, a chief difference between the builders of Sechimbajo and the builders in Mesopotamia and Egypt the Sechimbajo people had no pottery, right? That is the only difference according to these archaeologists. <laughs> That's not much, all right? That's... All right, uh, before we continue with our corn lesson, right? I know we little sidetracked, but uh, we had to uh, mention and talk about what I just... Uh, what we just reviewed all this stuff in Peru and all these ancient sites. Uh, now in America, remember, we had the mounds too. It says here the history of Jonesville. Jonesville has a rich history dating back thousands of years as the site of the Troyville Indian Mounds and the site of the Great Mound, which stood at the center of the ring levee of the mounds and stood 81 feet tall, the second tallest mound in North America. The Great Mound was bulldozed down in the early 1930s to make the bridge approach at Jonesville on the Catahoula side of Black River. So this was bulldozed down. You see how they destroy history, right, on purpose. It didn't fit with the history they were going to teach you when they were colonizing you, making you forget who you were, right? So they had to destroy it. All right, so it says, continuing, that bridge was demolished by in July of 2009. So that bridge was demolished as well. So that was for no use. 
the original dirt from the Great Mound was donated to the Catahoula Parish Historical Society. So the dirt was donated to the Parish Historical Society, the Catahoula Parish Historical Society, to form the bottom layer of the half-scale replica of the Great Mound being constructed at the end of the Block High School football practice field alongside Highway 84 in Jonesville. So it's they made a replica with the dirt. Why didn't they just leave the originals? They're not even using the bridge right now. I mean, come on. Purchase price of the Great Mound sold to the state of Louisiana for fifty dollars in the nineteen thirties. So <laughs> they demolished uh, ancient temples, right? Historic sites, megalithic sites, or well, mounds, right? I mean, they're pyramids. And they sold it for fifty dollars, and then they donated it to a parish. All right. I mean, you gotta start thinking outside the box now. You know, ancient uh, world, the old world was in the Americas. I mean, we got all this uh, in the pottery, in the in the uh, walls, depictions of corn, and all these uh, temples and all these places in, in, in that world, the so-called old world. Uh, there's no evidence of cobs over there because they were depicting what happened before them. You know, just like uh, the Hindus uh, holding the corn there, they're depicting what happened before them. The gods, right? The, the time of the gods. That was ancient times, prehistory for them. So they're talking about the old world, the Americas. All right, so uh, let's continue. This is the imposing exterior of the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. This is one of many libraries where time detectives searched for published sources on Egyptian maize. We had documented 124 corn cobs in Egyptian tombs, temples, and scrolls by August of 2008. A preliminary report in this study was presented to the First Atlantic Conference on August the 16th. By October of last year, my associates and I had documented 425 corn cobs in ancient Egyptian art. Even you can become an instant authority on Egyptian maize, simply by examining art books at your local library or at your second-hand bookstore. Here is a summary table of what we found. Note that during the last phase of Egyptian history, the post-dynastic period at the bottom, the corn cobs had become so stylized that they didn't look anything at all like Indian corn. Here is an example of a mural from Hatshepsut's temple. This reconstruction is by Howard Carter in 1909. It appeared in an exhibit at the Metropolitan Museum in New York City in 12205. Uh, 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 the museum is known simply as the Met. It was also published in a book about the exhibit by Catherine Rorick. Oddly enough, Nobody at the Met seems to have noticed that the New World Corn was part of the Hatshepsut special exhibit. Here's an enlargement of the maze in Hatshepsut's temple. This illustration shows the corn cobs that decorate a single room in Hatshepsut's temple. The room is called the Animus Chapel. There are over 30 corn cobs intermingled with the fruits, breads, and jars in the offering displays. Men wearing fish costumes represent ocean travelers from beneath the seas. They were called mermen or seamen. One merchant on the left carries a corn pod and a seed bag. These symbols reveal the role of merchants in dispersing maize all across the world between 5000 and 1000 BC. The earliest destination for New World copper and corn was the Middle East. Here we see a genie holding a corn cob. This Assyrian artifact dates to about 900 BC. Most doctrinaire scholars identify the seed pod as a pine cone. However, the artistic and agricultural context of the Assyrian civilization suggests that the genie is actually holding a cob of maize. Here is another example. Here is another one. My associate, Mark McInerney, says that the Assyrians were famous for growing huge supplies of grain, not for planting pine trees. Indeed, most of the items that we see in the hands of genies look more like corn cobs than they do pine cones. Here is a sample of corn cobs from ancient India, Mexico, Peru, and modern America, and they have a similar appearance to the Assyrian corn cobs. This illustration is from a Babylonian stone tablet. It shows two riders on horseback moving alongside parallel corn rows. The height of corn is exactly the same that the Spaniards reported in Peru, and this artifact dates to about 1000 BC. Here is a comparison of the native Peruvian and Babylonian corn rows. The genie on the left is from a stone slab in the British Museum. The Birdman on the right was sold at Sotheby's Auction House in London. 
They date to a period from about 700 to 900 BC. And the middle is an example of the corn plant from another Babylonian tablet. Notice they are all very similar. Here is an example of the Babylonian tree of life. It is a tree of corn cobs. Each branch terminates in an ear of maize. Here's another tablet from Babylon, and it shows a farm scene featuring a corn row and a litter of pigs. Here's a colored image of the Babylonian corn row. This is a cylinder seal showing a man with two corn plants. The artifact is at the Louvre Museum in Paris. It was found at the archaeological site of Iraq in Iraq. The artifact dates to about 3000 BC. This is the Warka vase from the Baghdad Museum. It dates to about 3300 BC. We see along the lower register a row of corn plants with irrigation ditches running between them. The plant can be identified as maize because of the huge size of cobs, the waffle pattern on the cobs, and the very large leaves and stalks. Uh, Alright, so Mr. Uh, Thompson was just showing this uh, Warka vase, as it's called. As you can see here in the bottom is where you would find the uh, maiz, or the corn, right? Uh, depiction. And this is in the, in the other side of the world, right? This is very old, according to their chronology, right? And this is how uh, it looks, you know, if it was painted. Right, with the colors in the bottom, you can see the corn as how Mr. Uh, Thompson was describing it in the video, and that's how they uh, appeared in the, uh, Babylon and Syria. That's how they look in Uruk and all those places. It says here, in order to trace mice paternity, botanists led by colleague, my colleague John Dobley of the University of Wisconsin rounded up more than 60 samples of Teosinte from across its entire geographic range in the Western Hemisphere and compared their DNA profile with all the varieties of maize. They discovered that all maize was genetically most similar to Teosinte, typed from the tropical central Balsas River Valley of southern Mexico, suggesting that this region was the cradle of maize evolution. So the cradle of maize evolution, we saw that agriculture is basically what helps uh, create civilizations and, and for people to settle down so as you can see the cradle of maize evolution is over here so agriculture right so the cradle of civilization actually you know so you see how they have cradle here in parentheses right so they're not going to tell us straight up the cradle of civilization they're going to say the cradle of maize evolution but you know they teach us that um sumeria mesopotamia is the cradle of civilization but we are seeing that there's there was civilizations on this side of the world that are older than Mesopotamia and archaeologists are confirming that in these days, right? After 2008, they started finding a lot of things in Peru, all right? So let's continue. So it says, furthermore, by calculating the genetic distance between modern maize and balsas teosinte, they estimated that the domestication occurred about 9,000 years ago. You hear that, right? That's 7,000 BC, 9,000 years ago. It says here, For most of human history, our ancestors relied entirely on hunting animals and gathering seeds, fruits, nuts, tubers, and other plant parts from the wild for food. It was only about 10,000 years ago that humans in many parts of the world began raising livestock and growing food through deliberate planting. These advances provided more reliable sources of food and allowed for larger, more permanent settlements. Native Americans al alone domesticated nine of the most important food crops in the world. So Native Americans are responsible for domesticating nine of the most important food crops in the world. You hear that, right? I mean, that goes to show you that's, that's where it or originates and it's longer, it's older, right? Including corn more properly called maize or semais, which now provides about 21% of human nutrition across the globe. It says here, uh, corn originated in the Americas. In the autumn, we see a type of corn called Indian corn, but really all corn, some 250 kinds of it, is Indian. Called maize in many languages, corn was first cultivated in the area of Mexico more than 7,000 years ago. The spread throughout and spread throughout North and South America. Native Americans probably bred the first corn from wild grasses and crossed high yielding plants to make hybrids. At the right are three varieties of Lenape corn. 
Delaware, black or blue corn, grandmother corn, and white flower corn. Old varieties of corn typically had small ears with eight or ten rows. Native Americans, including the Lenape of the Delaware Valley, used corn for many types of food. The foods which we know were derived from corn in the in the Iroquois nations include dumpling, tamales, hamini, and a ceremonial wedding cake bread and uh, tamales because we still eat tamales all over the, the, the American continent you know all the native tribes uh, a lot in the Spanish countries also they make tamales right uh, today corn has become the most widely grown crop in the Western Hemisphere it is a staple in Latin American diets and in the United States alone corn has given rise to regional specialties as grits hush puppies ash cakes uh, Dodgers, muffins, crackling bread, Johnny cakes, and corn pone or pon. The word uh, pun or pon is derived from an Algonquin word and is related to the Delaware word baked, a pan. So, pan, right? Again, pan or pancio, right? They were calling corn in Italy pancio, and that means, and for us, pan is bread. So, you see that the word a pan the, for the Napoli Delaware. Oh, the Algonquin word, I'm sorry, it's, it's actually means baked. So, um, Native Americans also use corn for other purposes, so, such as uh, mattresses, containers, and toys. Alright, so it was very useful. So, I ran into this place here called uh, Corn Springs, right, in California. Before I continue, I wanted to mention it to, to you guys, because I thought it was interesting. And it pertains to this, I think. Uh, so it says here, Corn Springs is a palm oasis situated in Chihuahua Mountains of the Colorado Desert. Oh, Chuck, Chuckwalla, sorry. In Riverside County, California, United States, 17 miles southeast of Desert Center. Native Americans relied on the springs and they engraved many petroglyphs on the rocks in the area. In the late 19th century, miners in the area also re relied on the springs and they established a Corn Springs Mining District in 1897. The springs were added to the United States National Register of Historic Places in 1998. The springs were used for thousands of years by nomadic Native Americans. The Chemehuevi, Desert Cahuilla, and Yuma bands frequented the spring and carved elaborate petroglyphs in the nearby rocks. Some of the oldest rock art is over 10,000 years old okay at times there was enough surface water for gardening by the springs okay so at times and we have people here they're uh, already doing their petroglyphs 10,000 years ago right so and it says at times there was enough surface water for gardening by the springs the Indians also utilized the fruit of the palms early white visitors found feral corn plants in the vicinity I don't know what they mean by feral, because feral is like uh, savage or wild, like a, but usually pertaining to an animal. You know, corn doesn't grow wild, so I don't know if they mean the teosinte, but either way, it says here they found feral corn plants in the vicinity, giving the spring its present name. All right, so definitely, I I believe this has something to do uh, with some ancient uh, place where they were growing corn, uh, the Native Americans, uh, there was civilization there. Uh, this place. Uh, basically, is in the site. Uh, if you don't know, uh, Joshua Tree National Park in California, Joshua Tree, also uh, very uh, significant, I believe. I mean, we know of Joshua in the Bible, right? We know that um, if you saw my past video, uh, Moses in America, yeah, you would see that Mount Nebo and all that, and De Deuteronomy 34 is right there uh, in the vicinity of Utah. So, not too far away from here. Uh, in California, this part right here, so Joshua Tree National Park, and it's really old. So, hey, we know that Joshua, <laughs> there's a lot of verses in the Bible, and Joshua, especially uh, in the book of Joshua, a lot uh, uh, referring to corn. So, hey, you link it up, we link it up, we'll see, but um, I think so. So, let's continue. So, again, we got uh, Gunnar Thompson, right? He's so convinced of what he's finding. He's realizing exist uh, in these uh, historical drawings and records, uh, in the uh, pottery and everything he's finding in these uh, museums that uh, maize existed or that these people knew of maize. That he's saying that, you know, 
it, it was in Egypt back in those times and that they were traveling back and forth on ships like nothing. Um, but um, there hasn't been found any fossilized you know, corn like we have in Peru and in the Americas all over, right? So they did have the drawings, they did draw it in their temples, uh, be, but again, they're telling a story. All right, they're just telling a story in these in these uh, hieroglyphics. All right, so it says here, amazing horizons. A stunning discovery will change everything most people believe about the origins of Western civilization. It may well change everything we imagine about human destiny. It can now be revealed that Indian corn blossomed with equal vigor along the shores of the Nile River. Uh, we, you know, we're relating this with the Mississippi and the Gulf of Mexico at the very dawn of history. This phenomenally prodigious cereal plant gave struggling humans everywhere a new freedom from the chains of barbarism because it gave them a reliable source of food. So corn seems to have been the main uh, agricultural plant that helped pe uh, these uh, nomadic people settle down and create civilizations. All right. Indian corn, or maize, was the principal food of the New World natives. It was also the quintessential fuel of progress that enabled the pharaohs to envision building stone pyramids and expanding empires in the Middle East or South America or North America, right? Because ancient Egypt over here. It's true that old world grains such as wheat, barley, millet and oats sustained the earliest farming communities. However, when ancient rulers decided to build city-states and global commercial empires, they turned to New World maize as their grain of choice. So these Egyptians, he's saying on the other side, they turned to us in America for maize to start their civilization. So wouldn't that mean that we already, uh, if we had it first, then wouldn't we already have started the civilization? We wouldn't wait till they do it on that side and then we do it after, you know? I mean, it says here, corn uh, was needed to feed uh, the legion of slaves, soldiers, merchants, and masons, whose backbreaking efforts erected the first true civilization on the planet. Uh, Mr. Thompson's uh, study team, he calls them uh, the NWDI, uh, identified over 400 corn cobs in the ancient tombs and papyrus crows of Egypt. Several hundred more were identified on artifacts from art archaeological sites in the Middle East. At Babylon and Uruk in ancient Iraq, evidence of the earliest maize agriculture coincides with the introduction of metal-edged plows and the onset of cornrow farming. The additional use of corn drills and corn cribs confirmed that maize farming technology was distinct from the traditional methods of cultivating small grains. Indeed, farming wheat, barley, sorghum, or oats involved field hoeing and broadcast scattering, not drills. Farmers stored small grains in bags, not cribs. So he's saying that um, the way they depict uh, them planting uh, the, the, the agriculture or their plants in these hieroglyphs, it looks like they're doing corn because it's different how you would plant uh, wheat or barley or any other plant. You, don't, you wouldn't have to make such a deep ditch just uh, scatter it uh, as he's saying uh, the seeds um, so uh, I mean we're gonna talk about that more in depth uh, as we go there are two kinds of large production field farming in medieval Europe wheat farming and maize farming this is an uh, 15th century French uh, drawing the English farmer Jethro Tull invented the mechanical corn drill in 1700 Babylonians had a hand-operated corn drill circa 700 BC. Large seeds were dropped into the funnel or hopper, and these were fed by a tube directly into the furrow. So keep in mind that the corn drill and the plow were used primarily for deep seed planting of large seeds. This is not an appropriate method for planting wheat. Wheat is planted in what is called the broadcast fashion. This illustration shows two more versions of the Babylonian seed drill. Egyptians planted large seeds such as corn by laying them on the ground in front of the plow. These were then pushed under by the plow as it cut a furrow for the next row of seeds. An early method of planting wheat involved using hand choppers to cultivate the soil. Then a farmer scattered seeds on the ground. Throwing handfuls of seeds across the ground was called the broadcast method of sowing. 
Finally, goats were driven across the field to drive in the seeds. In this Egyptian mural, a farmer scatters seeds after the field has been plowed. Next, a team of goats would be driven across the field to drive in the seeds. The broadcast method of planting resulted in a thick stand of short wheat plants. We see more evidence that Egyptians were farming maize by the nature of the granaries that are often portrayed in the tomb murals. In this example, the granary has a corn crib and a stack of corn cobs that are still in the husk. Seed corn was typically stored while still in the husk. Egyptian women are shown in murals carrying seed bags and scattering seeds with their right hands. So the, the large flat floodplain along the margins of the Nile River was ideal for planting maize. Each year during the inundation, the Nile River deposited a thick layer of highly fertile soil over the surface. After the river receded, surveyors checked the alignment of marker stones that identified the boundaries of the farmer's fields. Then the laborers went to work using plows to turn in large seeds that are carefully placed in front of the plow. This method of corn row farming is clearly seen in the Amarna tomb mural of Wererni at 2350 BC. It says corn was planted in rows that were about one cubit apart. This space provided sufficient room for the leafy maize plants to grow, and it provided room for the farmers to cultivate the soil and to harvest the crops. The method of using rows that were spaced so far apart was only appropriate for maize farming. It was not used for planting wheat. Wheat crops were grown in drier soil, and they grew like a grass in very close proximity that resulted in shoulder-high stands of wheat. Corn rows, on the other hand, typically grew above the farmers' heads, and this was is, and this is what if we see in papyrus illustration from about 1200 BC. In this case, the single maize pot extends from the end of the stalk. This top cop variety of maize was the one was once the most common kind of corn in both Mexico and Babylon. Okay, so he's saying that uh, this uh, particular uh, maize with the corn on the top is what they're seeing in the hieroglyphs a lot in uh, ancient uh, depictions in Babylon and Syria, right, and even in Mexico and Peru. By 2600 BC, Pharaoh uh, Snefru sent a huge expedition overseas to an unknown destination, says here. We know for certain that the Egyptian explorers were already familiar with maize, and it seems most likely that bags of corn were part of the food supplies on the Egyptian ships because corn is one of the most durable foods. Sahuri's expedition to Punt followed in 2460. Mentuhotep III's expedition sailed in two. 1000 BC and Hatship Suits expedition to Punt occurred in about 1470 BC. We know for certain that Hatship puts Nubian voyagers establish a colony along the shores of Mexico, says here, right? And it, and it is further evident from Jewish folklore that the Pharaoh, Pharaoh Queen was familiar with the location of Peru. My point is this, all the major civilizations of the Americas lag behind those of the Middle East and Egypt, from which they must have learned about mass production, farming technology, seed selection, and plant breeding. So according to Mr. Thompson, you know, he's saying that um, the Americas learned from the Middle East and Egypt uh, how to plant corn and agriculture, right, and the civilization and all that. We know better now, you know. I know he was, he was finding overwhelming evidence. And I respect all the work he did, uh, but you know we're 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 linking it up with new evidence, with new uh, information, with uh, what we remember, what we know of our people from the past, all right? What's written in historical records, and I'm going to continue to talk about that right now. So let's go. Uh, continuing on ceremonial occasions celebrating the resurrection of Osiris, God of the Dead. There was a special kind of corn that was served to royalty and to priestly participants. An earthen effigy of the god was impregnated with corn seed, and it was then watered for several months until immature cobs appeared at the very tops of the stalks. These cobs are almost spear-shaped. They certainly look nothing like immature wheat plants. Probably the immature plants were eating as a fruit. Because of this stage of arrested development, they would have been very sweet and succulent. This delicacy is probably the food that has been referred to in Egyptian texts as the corn of Osiris. All right, so we're going to get into now mythology and the religious aspects of uh, corn in Egyptian uh, history and 
you're going to see that, you know, not only there, but in Babylon and the, the Greeks and even in the Americas, of course, you know, with the corn gods and the corn goddesses, you know, the maize gods. It's very important as well over here, and it's very religious uh, symbol uh, on this side of the earth as well. So let's go. Here's a comparison of Mangled, Mangelsdorf's theoretical podcorn with a modern maize plant. The big difference is that the podcorn has the ear of corn at the very top. Note the red arrow. In modern maize, the corn cobs are all situated along the sides and toward the bottom of the plant. You might recall that the corn plants we saw from Babylon and Rome also had the corn cobs at the very top. A few top co cob maize plants still exist in Oaxaca State in Mexico and in Guatemala. Everywhere else, they have been replaced by the modern hybrid corns with the cobs along the sides. One variety of the ancestral corn plant adapted itself to hot, dry climates and to high altitudes where moisture is scarce. This is the modern form of wild corn called teosinte, or wild corn grass called teosinte. The plant is frail and skinny like most hot climate grasses. The seeds of this plant are inedible, but it is, it is still a genetic relative of the corn family. One way that we know the Egyptians and Babylonians had maize is the location of the seed pot at the very top of the plant. Here are some examples from Babylon, all around 3000 BC. Here are Babylonian corn plants from marshy or delta environments. The artworks date to about 1000 BC. Here's an Egyptian harvesting top cob corn plants on the right. The corn has two characteristic features. One, the top cobs with hairs at the top. And two, corn or maize is typically shoulder height or higher, whereas wheat on the left is typically waist height uh, to shoulder height. Here's an example of top cob maize in China from a 16th century herbal. Here's a Roanoke, Roanoke Indian corn plant from the coast of Virginia in 1586. Francis Drake had his naturalist draw the picture when he rescued the colonists of Roanoke who had been abandoned by their landlord. My associate Mark McInerney sketched these two top cob maize plants during an expedition he took to Mexico and Guatemala. This is the heirloom variety of maize. These plants are quickly becoming extinct because they do not produce as large a per acre yield of grain as do the hybrid modern corns. Here we see the same type of corn plant in a Mexican folk art painting. The Bubastus treasure hoard in Egypt has provided further clues. Here we see a golden drinking flask on the left. The relief carved surface is identical to that of the golden sweet variety of maize. Another New World plant Crookneck squash is also seen along with maize in most of the ancient Egyptian tomb paintings. Alright, so we're going to continue. It says, corn was eaten at almost every Native American meal. Corn, also known as maize, was an important crop to the Native American Indian. Eaten at almost every meal, this was one of the uh, Indian's main foods. Corn was found to be easily stored and preserved during the cold winter months. Often the corn was dried to use later. Dried corn was made into a uh, hominy by soaking corn in water until the kernels split open. These would be drained and then fried over a fire. American Indians would also ground corn into cornmeal. They would use mortars and pestles made from either rock or wood. Corn was placed into the hollowed out mortar and then pounding the corn with the pestle. This would grind it up into a powdery form. Cornmeal could then be uh, used for cornbread corn syrup or corn pudding. Often cornmeal was mixed with beans to make succotash, succotash or to thicken other foods. All right, so it's very important. And um, I don't know if you guys remember, but in Egypt, you know, it says that Egypt was a, a association of bread and that's what the Romans used to say or the Turkish people or whatever. And, um, you know, what bread? Now that we know that we can make, you know, corn bread and dough out of corn and we see that Egyptians uh, grew uh, corn heavily the ancient Egyptians or the ancient Americans all right same thing so you can you know that what they're talking about when they, they say they lived off bread or pan right a pan and pancio all means corn you know it turns out that it all means corn the, the, the original words for these, these uh, people were referring to corn all right so let's continue and it says here uh, old kingdom and middle kingdom maize cobs 2500 BC to 1781 BC it says a mural from Amenem Het's tomb, 2000 BC ab above, or the one you're seeing right now, 
is presently in the Cairo Museum. The food display on the right includes a typical maize cup painted yellow with green husk leaves. Gotta picture it because this is black and white, but Pharaohs and the wealthy ate immature sweet corn as a fruit. So immature, meaning they ate it fresh out of the plant. All right, remember that. Fresh out of the plant. Field corn that was fed to the masses was not portrayed in royal mortuary art because it was regarded as unclean. So the other corns, right? The field corn, right? We know that's different. People who do agriculture in the United States, they know, you know, the sweet corn and the field corn, two different things, right? Uh, continuing, a new kind of sweet corn, the corn of Osiris, became popular during the New Kingdom as a magical food of immortality. It came from the Western Duat, or Paradise. Wow. So it came from Paradise, right? The Promised Land, Paradise. Or as Mr. Gunnar Thompson told us in the very first video of this corn series, that the Promised Land was North and South and Central America. America the old world all right this is the end of part three stay tuned for the last part part four which is coming up and we're going to get into basically what I've been trying to get into the whole time I just had to talk about all these things we've talked about in the last three videos but we're going to talk about corn in the Bible